Two All right. Uh, well, thanks for being here. I'm, uh, I'm uh, Nathan Cortez from SMU Law School. My focus um, has been on how the law deals with kind of novelties in medicine and bioethics, uh, kind of following in the footsteps of one of my mentors across campus here, uh, Hank Greeley. So um, I, uh, I've spent the last 10 to 15 years thinking about digital health and mobile health trends, including telemedicine, uh, all the way back to my days of practicing law in Washington, D.C. before I entered academia. And it's been fascinating watching these technologies mature from the fringes of medicine to the mainstream. Uh, and with that perspective, it's interesting to see how the technologies have evolved. And in turn, as the technologies mature, medical practice starts to evolve with it. And as medical practice evolves, the law is inevitably the last to catch up. And so you have this, um, this delay effect where the technology is out in front, medical practice eventually starts to incorporate it, and then the law is always the last to catch up. Um, and so my, my goal today is, is to talk about some of the law. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to cover the, the following three topics um, very broadly. And, my, my charge is to canvas the universe of laws and regulations and ethical and practice guidelines that apply to telemedicine. And so I'm going to talk about both federal and state law. And on the state level, I'm going to give special attention to two states that have taken interesting approaches. California, because I think it would be useful for a lot of uh, medical students in California to understand. And Texas, which a lot of people are familiar with because it's been the laggard in adopting laws that are friendly to telemedicine. And so uh, I'll, I'll close by talking about a few of the recent ethical and, and practice guidelines that have been published. So uh, before I jump in to some of the weeds here, I want to preface by giving a big picture theme to carry with us. Um, and so the big picture theme in, in all the work I've done researching how the legal system adapts to mobile health technologies and telemedicine and digital health and, and all these technologies and practices, the legal system basically takes one of, one of two approaches. It has to decide, do existing laws and regulations and frameworks adequately address the technology and practice? Does it treat it fairly? Does it unnecessarily burden it? Does it accommodate it? Does it deal with the novel risks it might present? Uh, or do we need to create new laws and regulations and ethical standards and guidelines for the practice? So basically, do existing frameworks suffice or do we need something different that is more carefully tailored to any unique benefits and burdens that the practice entails? And so uh, you see this kind of, you see these growing pains with a lot of these new trends and, and telemedicine is a good case study in that. So, for example, some of the some of the questions state and federal law have, have had to grapple with are, can you establish a valid doctor-patient relationship through telemedicine contacts without an in-person evaluation or an in-person meeting? Uh, is that, can you prescribe to that person? Can you diagnose them? Can you get reimbursed for those services? Uh, what type of medical advice is suitable for telemedicine? Are there specific types of, di di of diagnostic and treatment practices that are particularly well suited to telemedicine? And conversely, are there particular practices and, and, uh, and treatments in, in the therapeutic areas that are particularly bad fits for telemedicine? Um, what insurers, uh, a lot of state and federal law deals with insurance and reimbursement. What should we pay for? Uh, what practices, what technologies, what safeguards do we need? How many do we need new coding systems? Uh, how much should we pay? Are we going to save money? Is this going to generate more expenses? And uh, on the clinical side, uh, legal liability always looms. So, are clinicians liable in the same way they would be as in a face-to-face -face encounter? Uh, if someone is misdiagnosed or mistreated or is otherwise the, sub the, the uh, subject of negligence, is the person at the originating site uh, responsible and to what extent, or is, is the person uh, at the patient site? 
uh, the remote physician. So there are all these tricky questions, and our legal system has to figure out, do we create new laws and new rules, or do we use existing frameworks? And when I say legal system, I'm really talking about all three branches of government. Uh, courts, how do courts create new laws and explanations and, and standards uh, that they use to hold people accountable? Uh, how do they assign liability? The legislature has to do a lot of grappling with this. Do we create new laws? Uh, do we accommodate telemedicine? Do we try to rein it in? Uh, you know, what are the benefits and risks? And then you have executive agencies like HHS and the FDA and CMS and all these executive branch agencies that really have to figure out what they do with telemedicine. And so, not surprisingly, the legal system moves very slowly, but we're now at a point at which the legal system has finally settled into some patterns. And so I'm going to try to describe those patterns uh, in this lecture. So uh, just before we jump in, I thought this recent article is really interesting. This is a PBS NewsHour article about telemedicine uh, being used in a pinch after Hurricane Harvey. Now, what struck me about this article and this phenomenon is that Houston has one of the biggest medical centers and one of the biggest medical districts and concentrations of hospitals in the country, if not in the world. And you have world-class facilities like MD Anderson uh, and the like. And so it's pretty striking that a city like Houston uh, would be uh, in pretty dramatic need of phys remote physician services uh, and, and diagnostics and treatment. So. Uh, this article touches on how telemedicine became particularly useful after Hurricane Harvey. Uh, and the caption here to me is interesting. It says, it's thanks to a recently passed law that it's even possible. In May, Texas became the last U.S. state to allow physicians to see patients by telemedicine without an initial in-person visit. Uh, so I'm going to tell the Texas story uh, when I get into state law. But first, let me start with federal law. So. It's important to distinguish what the federal government can regulate and what states can regulate. So the federal government is primarily, when we're talking about health care, the federal government is primarily concerned with insurance and reimbursement. And states have responsibility to regulate physicians in the practice of medicine. So you don't really have legal standards of care uh, coming out of the federal government. A lot of the nitty gritty will be in state law. And of course, that will vary state to state, which raises its own problems for an industry that's trying to, uh, trying to spread over all 50 states. And so federal law is primarily concerned with money. And there are two aspects to the money issue. The first are grants. You have a lot of demonstration projects and programs and grants that encourage telemedicine and establish pilot programs and try to measure it. Is it going to work in this context? Is it going to work in this federal program or that federal program? And then you have a huge set of really complicated rules regarding reimbursement. Are federal programs going to pay for telemedicine? Which services do they pay for? How much do they spend? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to focus on a few federal pro programs uh, that have contemplated telemedicine, specifically and have created policies for paying for it. So the biggest is Medicare. Um, the federal health insurance program for the elderly and the chronically disabled. And telehealth services are covered under Medicare Part D, which applies to physician services and outpatient services. So Medicare Part A is hospital insurance. Medicare Part B is physician uh, services, uh, outpatient, and related services. And then you have Part C, which is like a Medicare HMO, and Part D is a prescription drug program. And so Medicare Part B does pay for telehealth services, uh, which I'll get into uh, the details of some of these requirements in a little bit. But the second big uh, federal program is more of a federal state program, and that's Medicaid. So currently, all 50 states have state Medicaid plans that cover at least some telehealth services, uh, though the coverage varies significantly from state to state. Um, and so I'm going to talk about Texas and California so you can see some of those differences. Uh, another big uh, area for telemedicine and telehealth is the Department of Defense TRICARE program. So TRICARE covers 
active duty military personnel and their dependents. And you have overseas programs and you have uh, people stationed in areas where there aren't always high concentrations of physicians. And so TRICARE has been uh, covering some telemedicine, telehealth services. And then finally, the Veterans Health Administration, uh, here on the bottom right, uh, is a highly integrated healthcare delivery system, and they're able to use telemedicine uh, in some pretty interesting ways. So these are just the four big program, federal programs that deal with telemedicine, but you also have several others that do, like the Indian Health Service. As you can imagine, a lot of Indian reservations are located in area, geographic areas where there's not a high concentration of physicians and specialists. Uh, and so each of these programs has to figure out what telehealth services are we going to cover, how much are we going to pay for them, what are the rules for reimbursement, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so uh, Medicare reimburses for telehealth, but you have to meet pretty specific requirements. Uh, the patient has to be in a certain geographic area. So sitting here in Palo Alto, we would not be eligible for Medicare telehealth services. You have to be in a health practitioner shortage area which is a federally designated uh, geographic area, or uh, in other rural or underserved areas. And so this website uh, run by the federal government, HRSA is the Health Resources and Services Administration. It's a sub-agency of HHS. And here you see uh, the website uh, allows you to search to see if the originating site is eligible to receive Medicare uh, reimbursement. And so, um, you have, I, I took pictures of some of the rules and uh, you have to be one of these facilities to qualify for reimbursement. Uh, so again, federal law is primarily concerned with money and how much we're going to pay for telehealth and what we're going to pay for. Uh, so here is a report from uh, the GAO. So this, this report was commissioned by Congress uh, in 2015 when it passed the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act. CHIP is the Children's Health Insurance Program that's currently lapsed, unfortunately. But that, that legislation required the GAO to study telemedicine and how, um, how Medicare and other federal programs were reimbursing for it. And so in, in April of this year, the GAO published this study and it has some interesting findings. So currently, Medicare pays for 81 different telehealth services, and there's a list of covered services on the CMS website. Uh, it's the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And so CMS has two approaches. It'll reimburse for telemedicine if it's similar functionally to an in-person treatment, but it will also reimburse for some telemedicine services if it's not similar, but has demonstrated clinical benefit to the patient. And so CMS will evaluate the evidence base for specific telemedicine intervention before agreeing to pay for it, if it is indeed novel and there's no real physical counterpart. Uh, so this study, which I, I went through um, in the box down here, it says that in a, over a five-year period, uh, Medicare added 41 new reimbursement codes for a specific telemedicine, but during that same time it denied 61 different applications for new codes. So the gov federal government's really active in this area. They're still trying to figure out what they're going to pay for and what they're not. But I've, uh, I've uh, taken excerpts of some interesting findings in these three paragraphs. So one of the first GAO findings was that less than 1% of Medicare beneficiaries receive, have received telehealth services. And among federal programs, the highest usage is in the VA system, where 12% of all veterans in the VA system have used telehealth uh, during the study period. And the most uh, the second paragraph here, the Department of Defense uh, uses telemedicine primarily for behavioral health and psychiatric services which account for about 80% of all telehealth uh, services and telehealth encounters. So I thought that was particularly interesting. And the next most uh, frequently used services are dermatology, cardiology, and pediatric services through TRICARE. Um, and then finally, the bottom paragraph, of uh, the GAO found that 45% of uh, veterans living in rural areas have used telehealth. 
so these are veterans who aren't living close to urban areas where you might have a big VA hospital or uh, VA facilities and clinics. And so that's a pretty staggering number. That's almost, that's roughly half of all uh, veterans living in rural areas have actually have used telehealth under the, VA, the Veterans Health Administration. Uh, so federal law is primarily concerned with reimbursement. There's been a lot of activity. So uh, when you're thinking about the law, the federal policy regarding telehealth, it's really important to track legislation because there's been a lot of activity and there will be a lot of activity. And as you can imagine, the American Telemedicine Association uh, is a, a huge player in a lot of these bills. Um, so the one bill, uh, the one recent bill that's passed is the 21st Century Cures Act, which President Obama signed before leaving office. Uh, the rest of these are bills that are pending before Congress, and I haven't memorized what all these uh, things mean, but uh, they all stand for something, and they all largely would expand Medicare payment and coverage for telehealth. So there's a clear trend pushing for increased Medicare reimbursement and reliance on telehealth services. Um, and the, of, of these, uh, and there are probably four to five bills that I couldn't squeeze on here. Of these bills up here, the CONNECT Act is probably the most likely to pass. It has some bipartisan support. And again, that would expand uh, Medicare coverage in different ways for telemedicine. Um, so one big empirical question that the federal government has been concerned about is studying whether expanded coverage for telemedicine services is going to save Medicare and other federal programs money by displacing in-person treatments or whether it's going to generate new expenses. And so with, all the, with a lot of these bills, the Congressional Budget Office has taken a look and it has tried to anticipate if this is going to generate more federal spending or reduce federal spending over the long term. And uh, you're probably familiar with the CBO from all the Affordable Care Act news, uh, all the bills to repeal and replace Obamacare. Is there going to be a CBO score? Is it budget neutral? Does it meet all these budget requirements? So the CBO is trying to figure out, and Congress wants to know, if we expand coverage for telemedicine, are we going to be spending more? Is this going to generate new services and more and more treatments? Or is it going to save money by perhaps giving us cheaper, more timely interventions? So it's actually a really fascinating empirical question that the, that the Congressional Budget Office is studying. Um, one, so before I shift from federal to state law, I just want to say that if you are involved in the telemedicine area and you are treating Medicare, Medicaid, VA patients and the like, uh, anyone covered by a federal health care program, all of the federal fraud and abuse laws kick in. So again, federal law doesn't regulate the practice of medicine, it doesn't tell us when a physician is negligent and, and when she's not, but it does provide pretty harsh penalties for health care fraud and reimburse like upcoding or providing service or, or billing for services never provided. So tele, you know, in, any telemedicine that's covered by Medicare is also subject to the anti-kickback statute and the Federal False Claims Act and the Stark Self-Referral Statute uh, and the Medicare Fraud Statute. So these are really important laws to know uh, if, you, if you do seek federal reimbursement. All right. So shifting from federal to state law, uh, federal law again is concerned with reimbursement and funding. State law pretty much covers the whole gamut of issues, of legal issues that arise with telemedicine. Uh, so for example, one big issue is licensing. Can a physician who is not licensed in a state where the patient's located provide services to that patient? Can you have, can you have out-of-state physicians advising, diagnosing, even recommending treatments for patients in a different state. Um, so uh, states have independent authority to regulate the practice of medicine within their borders, but telemedicine is kind of obliterating these borders in a traditional sense. And uh, most states still require that out-of-state clinicians have a license uh, in the state where the patient is located. Uh, 51 state medical boards around the country currently require that physicians engaging in telemedicine be licensed in the jurisdiction where the patient's located 
15 states have special purpose licenses, so like a limited license uh, for you to practice out of state, and four states require registration. So we're seeing for, for uh, out-of-state telemedicine providers. So we're seeing state laws evolve here to become uh, a little more accommodating. The Federation of State Medical Boards has set up a system that allows people to easily uh, verify credentials for out-of-state uh, physicians. And uh, a related question to licensing is credentialing and privileging. So initially, confusion over who was responsible for credentialing physicians and giving them privileges was a real barrier to telemedicine adoption. But CMS and the, uh, the Joint Commission that accredits hospitals has decided that the facility where the patient is located has ultimate authority over whether a physician, a remote physician, has uh, privileges and credentials to provide care to that patient. Um, and so there are also lots of uh, interesting state law questions about what can establish a valid doctor-patient relationship. Does it have to be an in-person, face-to-face meeting? Can it be a video conference? Could it be a phone call, a text exchange, an email exchange? And so uh, a lot of states have been reluctant to allow uh, physicians to establish doctor-patient relationships without an in-person meeting, and then gradually these laws uh, started to accommodate telemedicine. Uh, but we still had a few laggard states, especially Texas. Again, Texas was the last state uh, that required an in-person meeting to establish a valid doctor-patient relationship. Uh, and then, just like the federal government, the third bullet here, state governments also have to figure out, just like Medicare and the VA and other programs, what technologies and services they're going to cover and the rules for reimbursing for those technologies and services. So, uh, so as of now, roughly 29, 30 states have telehealth parity laws which means that uh, public and private insurers have to cover uh, telehealth services the same as they cover an in-person service, if there's an equivalent. So if you have a telehealth services that largely tracks what an in-person visit would do, the reimbursement has to be the same, and this applies to both public and private payers. And so we call this telehealth parity because we require parity between the two. Uh, 18 states require their state Medicaid programs to have parity between in-person services and telehealth services. Uh, and a lot of states take a common approach on phone calls. They don't reimburse for phone consultations. Um, there are some exceptions for physicians seeking advice from other physicians, but if you're, if you're talking about conversations between physicians and patients, a lot of states won't reimburse uh, for that. Uh, and then you have questions about practice standards and malpractice. Um, again, courts and state legislatures have struggled to figure out, should we just transplant uh, our traditional laws and regulations for medical malpractice and practice standards from in-person encounters to telemedicine encounters? Um, and again, about 29 state medical boards require the same standard of care be applied. Now, the standard of care analysis will be a little different in a telemedicine case because it depends, you, you now have this technology as an intermediary where if you're not comfortable using a specific technology, then that might uh, fall below the standard of care. So identifying a specific standard of care is still a case-by-case -case basis depending on the case and the facts and the litigation but it all boils down to what a reasonable person with similar training and experience would have done in that case. And as telemedicine becomes more, uh, more commonly used, we'll see, we'll have a better idea of what the standard of care is. But you've had cases of first impression where it's hard to say that someone's negligent because it's hard to establish what the standard of care is when the practice is so novel. So now that we're seeing telemedicine mature, uh, we're also seeing standards of care mature, and it's often a moving target. What might be acceptable in 2015 may be totally unacceptable by 2018. So it's, it's really tricky to, to draw any, any hard and fast rules here.
Uh, and then finally, uh, you have state fraud and abuse laws just like you have federal fraud and abuse laws. So, um, so there's a lot going on. There's state legislation. It's hard to track all the different bills. Uh, in 2016, there were 200 separate bills, state bills introduced around the country addressing telemedicine roughly 30 of which have already become law and have already been signed into law by state governors. So there's a ton going on with state law. And I'm going to uh, spend a few minutes uh, giving you two examples. I'm going to talk about California and then Texas. So California was one of the first states to address telemedicine back in 1996 when it passed the Telemedicine Act. And it's been amended a handful of times. It was uh, amended in 2011, and I think again, in 2015. So I think it'd be most useful for a California audience just to go through some of the requirements in California. So, um, but California, so here are a bunch, for, for people's reference, here is a, a sample of California statutes and regulations that are specific to and explicitly contemplate telemedicine. And so from all of these provisions in the California Business Professions Code, the California Health and Safety Code, uh, all the way down to the California Code of Regulations, we have all of these rules uh, bulleted. So California law says that telemedicine can by itself establish a valid doctor-patient relationship without an in-person uh, visit. It says you do need a valid California license, however, to provide services to California patients. So California is not one of the 22 states that has joined this interstate medical licensure compact that makes it easier to practice uh, out of state. So in California, uh, you have to be a California physician to treat California patients. Uh, California specifically allows both synchronous and asynchronous treatment, meaning uh, store and forward type treatment where a patient may give you certain inputs or lab tests and values, descriptions, and then someone looks at it later and provides advice. Synchronous is when you have like a video conference. And so California says uh, we will cover and we will permit both synchronous and asynchronous, although asynchronous treatments are allowed only for specific types of uh, care. Uh, and I believe it's dermatology and maybe behavioral uh, treatment or, or psychiatric treatment. Um, so California also passed a specific law uh, regarding informed consent. So just like an in-person encounter, the physician has to uh, explain the benefits and risks of proposed treatments as well as alternatives if it's salient and has to receive either verbal or written informed consent from the patient, on, from the remote patient. And so again, California law specifically addressed that. Uh, California doctors can prescribe uh, non-controlled substances remotely. Controlled substances are off limits, and again, those are designated by federal law, kind of a joint process between the FDA and the DEA. Uh, and California law also specifies that the standard of care is the same uh, for telemedicine and telehealth services as it is for in-person encounters. And so they're trying, so what I said at the beginning about the legal system has to decide do we create new tailored laws for telemedicine or do we apply old legal frameworks and standards and expectations? These laws here are all examples of California specifically addressing telemedicine and either saying here is a, is a new law or expectation or we're making clear that the existing laws and expectations translate to telemedicine as well. Uh, so again, uh, here's a, a list of laws uh, that might be useful. And then there's uh, California Medicaid, the Medi-Cal program, which has specific, pretty detailed rules uh, for covering telemedicine. Medi-Cal generally requires real-time interactive uh, uh, audio or video communication. Uh, they don't allow uh, simply telephone conversations, email or fax communications. Uh, to create a doctor-patient relationship. Uh, they only allow store and forward asynchronous services to be provided for dermatology and ophthalmology. It wasn't uh, psych psychiatric care, it's, it's ophthalmology was the other one. And so there are pretty detailed rules for qualifying for California Medicaid reimbursement. All right, so that's California. 
Texas uh, provides a, a different, uh, an interesting contrast. So rather than kind of go through the different rules in Texas, I want to tell a quick story about how Texas uh, law evolved to deal with telemedicine. So a lot of you are probably familiar with the dispute between uh, Teladoc and the American Telemedicine Association and the Texas Medical Board. So there's been both state litigation and federal litigation between Teladoc, which is based in Dallas and is one of the biggest telemedicine companies in the country, and uh, the Texas Medical Board. So the Texas Medical Board, back in 2011, uh, kind of sent a warning shot that it was going to start going after Teladoc physicians in Texas for uh, kind of illegal practice of medicine through telemedicine. And the uh, Teladoc sued to enjoin those enforcement actions in state court. And then uh, the, the state litigation kind of resolved in Teladoc's favor. And in 2015, the Texas Medical Board uh, decided to issue rules that made telemedicine uh, more difficult to practice in the state. And it said, we're going to require an in-person visit to establish a valid doctor-patient relationship. And we're going to restrict video consultations with only very narrow exceptions. Um, and so this caused an uproar with Teladoc. And the state medical board uh, threatened enforcement action. And Teladoc sued in federal court this time. And it relied on federal antitrust rules. And it said that the Texas Medical Board was acting as an illegal cartel. So again, the classic example of a cartel is OPEC. Uh, in, in the United States, uh, cartels are regulated by the Federal Trade Commission and federal antitrust law. And so uh, Teladoc said, you have a state medical board that's comprised of physicians. And physicians have in, a self-interest in restricting competition uh, through telemedicine. And there was a Supreme Court case that dealt with a similar issue in North Carolina, not regarding telemedicine, but regarding state professional boards that would adopt these really restrictive rules in order to minimize competition from other practitioners. And so the Supreme Court opened the door to that kind of argument. And uh, you know, typically you think, well, the state medical boards are state agencies, and they have to be immune from antitrust liability, uh, but again, a, a recent Supreme Court decision opened the door for that, and Teladoc relied on that argument saying you're basically a cartel trying to restrict competition from telemedicine providers, and the Federal Trade Commission jumped in and filed an amicus brief uh, arguing uh, for Teladoc, taking Teladoc's side, and full disclosure, I wrote an amicus brief uh, or I joined an amicus brief with several colleagues from Texas, Texas health law professors, written by Bill Sage at the University of Texas that also took Teladoc's side. Um, so the FTC also, uh, also challenged uh, the Texas Medical Board. So you had this really interesting federal litigation. Texas was the last remaining state holding out, trying to make things more difficult for telemedicine providers in Texas. As you can see the timeline here, you have uh, the lawsuit, you have the Texas Medical Board rules in 2015, you have the lawsuit uh, going forward in 2016, and then in 2017, Teladoc and the Texas Medical Board asked the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, the level of appeal right before you get the Supreme Court review, they asked for 150 days to stay any injunctions or any court orders so they could reach a settlement. And during that time, the Texas legislature was considering bills to ease restrictions on telemedicine. And so the Texas legislature basically stepped in um, and, and made it, uh, they proposed a law that would allow a lot of the practices that had been legalized in other states. Um, and the parties settled. And in 2017, you have articles saying, uh, telemedicine finally have an open path in Texas, and in the wake of Hurricane Harvey, all these displaced patients can now rely on telemedicine, whereas it would have been impossible just a year earlier. 
Um, and the bill in Texas, again, addresses issues like what can establish a valid doctor-patient relationship, what is the standard of care, and this bill brought Texas into the mainstream, aligned with many other states, and making clear that telemedicine was going to be on equal footing as in-person encounters. All right, so that's a sample of federal and state law. Uh, there are also some ethical guidelines from organizations like the American Medical Association. So the AMA has been tracking telemedicine for years, and it has developed some pretty detailed policies on reimbursement and practice standards and quality measurement and staffing issues and various ethical practices. And in 2016, you see the date uh, up here on the top right, it says June 13, 19, uh, 2016, after three years of formal debate, the AMA finally adopted uh, guidelines for the ethical practice of telemedicine, which amends the AMA Code of Ethics, uh, which is on the bottom left here. And so the guidelines address issues like conflicts of interest, patient privacy, data security, um, standards of care, et cetera, et cetera. So again, the AMA establishes these principles saying telemedicine should be subject to the same standards of professionalism that in-person encounters are subject to. We expect physicians to be proficient in the technologies they're using. So again, it's one thing if you're not great at Microsoft Word and your computer freezes up all the time, but if that's a much bigger deal if you're in the, in the middle of a, a video conference uh, trying to diagnose a patient, for example. So these AMA policies deal with informed consent standards and uh, urging physicians to use their best judgment when considering whether telemedicine is appropriate given the patient's specific condition and their medical needs. Um, and then the AMA, in addition to promulgating these practice and ethical standards, and again, they're just standards, uh, they also play an advocacy role. So the AMA on its website has several draft model state bills that they send to state legislatures on telemedicine. So again, going back to my discussion of state law, there are dozens and dozens of bills, hundreds of bills indeed, being proposed each year around the country in state legislatures dealing with telemedicine, and groups like the American Telemedicine Association and the AMA are important for trying to standardize practices. Uh, again, I think most telemedicine companies operating in multiple states don't want to see a patchwork system where you have completely different standards in California than you have in Oregon or Texas and Oklahoma, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so finally, uh, one thing that uh, I want to close with is um, this interstate medical licensure compact. So again, this is uh, an agreement between 22 uh, different states that makes it easier for physicians to practice in multiple states. And uh, again, the state has to agree to join the medical licensure compact, uh, but if they do agree, physicians can apply for licensure in another state. And uh, when they do, they have to go through another background check and they have to have a valid license in their home state. Uh, they can't have any records of discipline or um, uh, disciplinary actions, uh, license suspensions, et cetera, et cetera. So again, this map shows who is in the compact and who isn't. And this is an important uh, trend to keep in mind because one of the big promises of telemedicine isn't just providing access between urban and rural areas and going to underserved areas. It's really crossing state lines. And if the medical licensure compact crosses more state lines than medical practice standards and expectations might become more standardized across jurisdictions. And you could imagine that state uh, medical boards might feel that they're losing a bit of their jurisdiction and power. If you have the more out of state physicians you have treating patients in your state, how much control do you really have over the practice of medicine there? So it's an interesting trend to watch. It hasn't you know, we're not yet at a tipping point, I don't think, uh, but I think over time there will be increasing pressure for states 
to get on board and join the medical licensure compact. Um, and, and again, the uh, Federation of State Medical Boards doesn't only have this compact, but they also engage in advocacy. They have a system for verifying credentials easily for out-of-state physicians. And they have their own model policy for the appropriate use of telemedicine. And so again, in addition to the AMA and other physician uh, practice, especially societies and the like, you have this Federation of State Medical Boards that has enunciated these principles, these standards uh, for evaluating and treating patients, for getting informed consent, uh, for protecting privacy and data security. Um, and it touches, the, the Federation of State Medical Boards policy touches on a lot of the same topics and themes that the AMA policy touches on. Um, so there's a lot going on. I understand that this flood of information may have been like drinking out of a fire hose, uh, but this is a broad overview. I wanted to point out some big differences between federal and state law, um, and I'm happy to answer questions if there are any. I had a general question. What's the experience been so far with this? I mean, uh, you could have some real, you could imagine some real horror stories and you could imagine better access and so on. I just sort of wondered whether, what sort of assessments have been made of, of how this has worked out thus far. Yeah, so I think there's not a homogenous experience with it. I think you're seeing a lot of studies that are trying to measure how effective telemedicine is and comparing it to baselines which are basically traditional in-person medical encounters. And so there's a, there are a bunch of studies that are trying to evaluate telemedicine vis-a-vis uh, -vis what we've been traditionally doing, traditional medicine, in-person encounters, and the experience is mixed. Uh, a lot of the studies are trying to evaluate things like do patients comply uh, with diet recommendations and medication adherence uh, to a higher extent if telemedicine is involved? Uh, are we providing more efficient care, more coordinated care? So it's being measured from several different dimensions. Efficiency, coordination, outcomes. Uh, and it's hard, it's hard to say that there's been a universally good or bad experience. I think it's mixed. And I think we're, we're just beginning to understand what is amenable to telemedicine and what's not. So certain things just aren't done through telemedicine. But you'd be surprised. I mean, you have, uh, you have some uh, kind of remote, robotically assisted surgeries that are being uh, used in areas where you don't have uh, like a good trauma care, for example. So we're really, we're really continuing to push the boundaries of what what we're doing, and we're measuring it the, you know, as we go along. What about the military? Have they adopted it at all? For uh, for you know, you would imagine it'd be a good thing for them because uh, access issues, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So um, on a previous slide, uh, I think before you came in, I talked about how the Tricare and the VA system are both uh, experimenting with telemedicine, and, and Tricare is the Department of Defense Health Insurance program for the. Um, active duty military personnel and their dependents. And as you imagine, there are people stationed all over the world. And there are uh, dependents and active duty personnel in remote areas. And so they are using telemedicine. Again, we're, they're experimenting it with it. Is it effective? Does it allow us to treat populations that otherwise might have problems linger and get worse? The VA, uh, so the, the Department of Defense, uh, uh, the, the, the data from the GAO study uh, here, if you look at this center paragraph, it said, uh, it said it's only 3% of 25,000 Department of Defense beneficiaries received care through telehealth, but um, they typically sought it for behavioral health psychiatry services, which accounted for 80% of all Department of Defense encounters. Um, and then they used it for dermatology, cardiology, pediatric care. But what's striking is the VA. So again, the VA, 12% of veterans in the Veterans Health Administration coverage have used telemedicine, which is pretty high. 
uh, compared to Medicare and the other programs. And uh, they use it for, uh, for a bunch of different services, including psychiatric care. You imagine a lot of, a lot of veterans with PTSD, for example. Uh, we were just talking before the lecture started about the VA's mobile health apps that help, help uh, uh, veterans self-report symptoms that algorithms then uh, use to try to predict someone's suicide risk. So the, the military, in many ways, is, is kind of pushing the frontier here. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see, because the VA is such a highly integrated healthcare system that they can probably experiment with telehealth in a much more purposeful way than Medicare could, for example. Yeah, I wanted to ask you more about the VA in particular, because it is such an integrated system. Do you know uh, if they also are motivated by like a theoretical cost saving? For the potential of it, or do you think a lot of it's just more out of need? You know, we have veterans that live very far away from the VA hospitals, and want to actually access them. Or, yeah, uh, I, I think it's I think it's probably a little bit of both. I think it's out of need, and we have a lot of beneficiaries who don't have easy access. I think it's also out of um, out of a different kind of need to use resources more efficiently, um, and so. If you compare the VA system to something like Medicare, Medicare basically sets a bunch of baseline expectations and it's not administered in the most purposeful way like a highly integrated system like the VA is. And looking back at the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, you saw all these demonstration projects and pilot programs and incentive systems trying to make Medicare providers more highly integrated and more purposeful in how they utilize resources and achieve better outcomes. They're basically trying to provide incentives to do things that the VA can more easily do because it is so highly integrated. Like the VA was on the forefront of using electronic medical records. Um, so the VA is able to do things that a program like Medicare just can't. Medicare, Medicare statute, Medicare's uh, structure is basically set up to create an efficient way to reimburse private physicians. But in VA hospitals and clinics, you have a, a highly integrated system. And it's, you know, the VA is uh, rightly criticized, um, but a lot of people are surprised to learn that they have such an innovative yeah. integrated system. I was system. just at the Palo Alto VA hospital this morning for a rotation, and it is incredible how patient-centered and integrated yeah. the, the care is. I was also wondering for the reimbursements, say through Medicare, Medicaid, or state program, uh, and you know how a lot of times it's an equal reimbursement for in-person versus telemedicine. Uh, is there been any pushback? Uh, I guess in the, in the sense that it seems like that uh, in person there's there are higher overhead costs. Uh, I mean certainly there's like some cost to setting up a really good telehealth system but uh, you don't have to have a physical building, um, anything like that. Yeah, you know, they, is so... It, is it fair, level playing field? When yeah, on the road? so yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a kind of a tug of war, um, well, tug of war is probably not the right analogy, but there's, there's definitely some friction between people who believe that telemedicine is being elevated and, and treated in a preferred way to traditional encounters and people who think that telemedicine is being uh, unfairly disadvantaged vis-a-vis -vis traditional care. Um, but that's that's kind of the big six million dollar question, you know, is, is telemedicine use going to generate more treatment, higher expenses, or is it going to be more efficient? In terms of the dollar of value, you know, putting them on equal footing with reimbursement dollars, uh, you would think would disadvantage and even encourage some people to rely on telemedicine rather than in-person uh, visits where you have to have a brick and mortar office. More convenient too. Yeah, and the facility has to comply with all kinds of state, and federal, and, and local rules that apply to healthcare facilities, you know, quality evaluations and the like. So, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm sure there, there are a number of academics and policymakers tracking this pretty closely. I imagine um, that for some services it is a real disadvantage to have all that overhead. 
Uh, I'd be shocked if there weren't some, some frothy health economists uh, uh, doing some interesting work in this area, just because of that. Uh, I have a question. Have you follow uh, changing topic towards wearables and smartphone apps? Have you followed recent uh, pre-certification program by FDA, which has given uh, nine different companies, including Fitbit? Usual suspects are also there, like Samsung and Apple, but Fitbit is relatively new into this area. It's not really a medical device, and they got into the pre-certification program by FDA, and then we look into FDA uh, view on looking into real world evidence, and I think it's um, it's this direction which we're going into. Like we don't have yet evidence, but let's let's don't like it's a chicken and egg pro problem, yeah. right? So before you uh, we give you the certification and you bring us evidence, and now the other way around, like okay, we pre-certify you and then bring some evidence. Like do you have opinion on this? Huh? Is that how I see it? Yeah, yeah. So I've been I've been tracking that pretty closely. I didn't really talk about the FDA um, in this lecture because you know the FDA doesn't do a whole lot in telemedicine, but I'm definitely tracking the FDA's pre-certification program, and it's interesting. You know, Scott Gottlieb is the new FDA commissioner. He was appointed by Trump, and he during the summer announced some pretty interesting changes in how the FDA regulates wearables and mobile health apps and the like. And you know, instead of, instead of emphasizing a product by product evaluation, like is this specific product safe and effective for its intended uses, um, what does the clinical data say, they're going to pre-certify companies who are basically basically like trusted companies that can get their products onto the market more quickly. And it's a pilot program, so it doesn't mean that all of a sudden every digital health company is going to be able to throw their, their FDA regulated products on the market. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, you know, uh, I often, in order to understand FDA regulation of mobile health devices, I often try to analogize it to other products the FDA regulates. So on one end of the spectrum, like, could you imagine if we had a pre-certification program for drug companies, where if you're an established drug company, you could get products on the market more quickly? I mean, on its face, it would kind of be absurd to not require good clinical evidence that a drug is safe and effective before it's on the market. Uh, but we have a lot of shortcuts. We have expanded use programs. We have... Uh, accelerated approval and all of these different programs to put drugs on the market more quickly with more lenience on the evidence base. Uh, the real world evidence pre presents all kinds of problems, but we don't really we don't really want to transplant the drug approval system onto mobile devices. It really would it probably be overkill. Um, but we also don't want mobile health devices and products to look like the dietary supplement market which the FDA also regulates, and it's full of junk science, and you can sell anything you want to and make claims about it, and as long as you have a disclaimer saying that this statement has not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration, this product is not intended to diagnose, cure, mitigate, treat, prevent diseases or other conditions, you can put it out there. So there has to be a middle ground. I've been tracking and thinking about what that middle ground should look like, but here we have a real middle ground that the FDA is experimenting with. So it's provocative, it's extremely provocative. There are some reasons to be skeptical, particularly about the real world evidence. Um, but there's no reason it couldn't work and it couldn't provide incentives for companies to generate better data and more data than they're incentivized to generate now. So I think it's worth trying. Uh, there are reasons to be skeptical. Um, but there are reasons that it might work. It's just crazy enough that it might work. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you also mentioned that there are, you know, uh, I think there are around 200 uh, laws that have been sort of put forward in different state legislatures and legislative bodies. And uh, I was wondering, has there been, you know, one political party that's been more keen on? Uh, you know, passing those laws than the other, or has it been relatively mixed? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, 
I know that there has been some bipartisan support for the federal bills. Uh, I haven't tracked the political leanings, uh, or, or I haven't tracked the politics of the state bills. I do, I, except for Texas. So it, you know, in Texas, a lot of it was a lot of the friction was being driven by the Texas Medical Board, and it was kind of blatantly protectionist, mm -hmm. self-interested. Um, which is why we filed that amicus brief in the litigation. Um, so I haven't seen any any sharp lines between, you know, you think there might be an urban-rural yeah. divide where people in urban areas might not feel the pressing need for telemedicine and, you know, representatives of rural districts might see it as a good thing. But it's hard to say. I don't, yeah, it's an interesting yeah. question. What do you think is going to happen with the agreements between the states uh, for licensing? Because, I mean, in a way it's quite strange. So you're allowed to practice telemedicine um, across state boundaries, but maybe you can't practice if you go and walk across the state boundary. Yeah, it's strange. So, in, in, a, lot, you know, in a lot of ways, they're essentially kind of limited use specialty licenses because, you know, it depends. Um, it depends on the type of reciprocity. So here you see four or five different colors on the screen. So it's still really complicated. You can imagine in some states, you essentially could um, you essentially could walk walk across the state boundary and, and advise and counsel and treat diagnose patients. Um, it's unlikely you could go you know perform surgeries in across state lines, but it, again, it would depend on the specific states and, and what they're amenable to. But yeah, I think it, it's a little bizarre. Um, you know, so lawyers... Does it apply to all, I mean, what is sort of, what specialities are covered? So, uh, you know, some of them we have talked about work probably fairly well with the telemedicine, uh, you know, ones with the psych. Telemedicine, you would imagine, would be a very good one. Um, and. Uh, but uh, do, do um, nurse practitioners, for example, if they were if they were doing family practice and telemedicine, would they be their licenses be uh, valid across the lines as well? You know, I I think individual. I, I'm not sure that. So this uh, I'm not sure the the extent to which this applies to other medical professionals, but I have seen anecdotal evidence and presentation. So I was, I, I attended a, a telemedicine digital health conference at Southern Illinois University and a local health system there had nurses and physicians talking about how they would perform telemedicine for patients in Missouri who were part of this health system. And so they developed some pretty interesting and it seemed pretty successful methods. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure the nurse practitioner, there, there were rules for who could do what. So just, at, just like in in-person encounters, you, you're licensed to do X, Y, Z. Can you also venture into to categories A, B, C? Well, that's another, that's another profession, another license. And so there are boundary drawing exercises that states have to, have to uh, entertain. And I, I think there's no really uniform approach. It seems to be highly, um, highly variable between states, uh, which is kind of a long-winded way of saying I'm not quite sure. Uh, HMOs. What about uh, HMOs adopting this? Like yeah. Pfizer, for example, is obviously a big, big one. Yeah. So, so the the private insurers, uh, like the public insurers, are dipping their toes into it, and they're curious, like Medicare and other programs are, whether it's going to save them money or cost them money long term. Um, so, in theory, telemedicine sh should save us money if we're able to get people the right care at the right time. It should cut off more serious uh, encounters, more expensive encounters. Uh, later in the disease progression. Uh, so in theory, we'd be saving money. Uh, but you could also imagine telemedicine representing yet another revenue stream that's added on to everything else we're already doing. Um, and again, you know, I'll, I'll kind of analogize this to the economic analysis uh, of spending after the Affordable Care Act. Uh, 
once we covered these tens of millions of, of patients, insurers spent more money because they were covering more people who had better access to services. And so you have to look at it with a really broad lens. You know, are, are people healthier and more productive? Uh, insurers might be spending more, but they may have a healthier population as a result. People who miss fewer, uh, fewer days from work, people who live long, longer, happier lives. So, you know, thinking short term and thinking narrowly, you know, the insur insurance companies might be spending more money, but the money might be worth it to their beneficiaries. Um, so again, and private insurers are dipping their toes into it, evaluating it the same way as public insurers are. Uh, is it effective? Is it efficient? Are, you know, where will the abuses uh, pop up? Um, you know, you can imagine the more common it becomes, the more billing schemes you might see taking advantage of it. Um, so yeah, I think they're, they're, um, they're stepping into it with the same cautious optimism that public insurers If you look at Kaiser, for example, they, you know, they have advice hotlines, which in a sense triage the patients, you know, um, and probably save them quite a bit of money because then the patients don't appear at the hospitals. Yeah. Yeah, and one interesting thing about, about telemedicine and mobile health is that by having these, these more accessible entry points into the healthcare system, you, you're able to give patients earlier, more convenient, perhaps less expensive advice on whether they, you know, to take an extreme example, either you're going to the emergency room and waiting to see someone, or you're scheduling a physician office visit a week or two from now, waiting to see someone, you're paying your deductible co-payment, and you might not get an answer immediately, or you might spend a lot of time and money and stress getting that answer. So telemedicine might represent a more convenient, cheaper way to determine for patients whether you need to go to, you know, do, do we need to go to urgent care, or an emergency room. So, you know, it's it's really compelling for parents. You know, I have two small kids. They always seem to get sick on Friday after 5 p.m. when the pediatrician's office closes, and we use the nurse triage hotline all the time. Uh, so, using an app, using having a video consultation, having some entry point into the system that will tell you whether you need to ramp things up or whether you should wait it out at home is going to be a, a huge convenience and uh, and hopefully a the, cost the, saver. The provider, like the Texas provider you mentioned, do they offer extended hours, you know, 24 hours maybe? So that would be another incentive for you to have that sort of access rather than have to wait the next day or, or you know, or have to travel if you're in a rural area. Yeah, yeah. So you have you have extended hours. You're you're you may have a higher uh, copayment or deductible, and maybe a little more pricey to get good advice. You know, at Sunday at 9 p.m. But uh, you know, if it's that important to you, or if you just can't wait, um, yeah, we basically have more options than you know waiting it out from until Monday morning, scheduling the earliest appointment with your physician, or going to an emergency room. No one likes going to the ER. It's much easier, more convenient to, to get someone on the phone or do a video consultation or uh, a chat. Uh, some 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 healthcare systems have you know, text. It, it's advising. interesting you mentioned the VA and the you know it's an integrated system and all the rest. And my son's in a residency <coughs> at the moment. And he it was a psych residency. So he, but he sees. He, part of the residency is at the VA and part is at the regular hospital. And um, so he was commenting that the psych um, at the VA is actually better than at the regular hospital in many, many ways. Interesting. And, 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 the, and because it's integrated, um, you know, just like when you go to Kaiser or something, you get all the medical records, it's just much easier actually for him to work at the VA. He was, he was saying, well, the, the patients are often you know, have some problems. But, but it's, it's quite interesting just saying that, that how different the systems are. Yeah. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of heterogeneity between, uh, between these health systems, and it's, it's probably 
there are probably more differences than similarities between a lot of systems. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much.